the next topic on coordination chemistry here is going to be a little bit of a lengthy discussion on isomers. Now for two compounds to be isomers, they have to have all the same number and type of each atom. Uh, in this case, it turns out there are two major types of isomers here. So the one on the left here is structural isomers, and the one on the right stereoisomers. Uh, structural isomers are going to have a totally different bond connectivity. So the atoms are gonna, that are bonded together are going to be different. Um, so again, all the same atoms total in the compound, but the atoms that are actually bonded together will be different. So we say a different bond connectivity. On the other hand, stereoisomers will have all of the same bond connectivity, but the three-dimensional arrangement of the atoms is what's going to be different. Uh, it turns out there are a couple major types of structural isomers. Uh, the first will be linkage isomers. We'll take a look at examples of those. And then coordination sphere isomers, and we'll take a look at a couple examples of those as well. There are also two types of stereoisomers. The first is geometric isomers, which uh, also called cis and trans isomers. And the second will be called optical isomers and will kind of be the most difficult ones to look at here. Uh, so we're going to take a look at both these and uh, or all, all, all of these in uh, quite a bit of detail. Uh, and let's start with those structural isomers. All right, so we take a look at our structural isomers and the first type we'll look at are the linkage isomers. So and the linkage isomers only deal with a few different ligands. Now we said a ligand's a Lewis base, an electron pair donor, and it has to have a non-bonding pair of electrons. Now in some of the ligands, like we see SCN here, there are more than one atom that actually has a non-bonding pair of electrons. And so it could potentially bind to the central metal ion through more than one atom. And we'd get a different link, if you will, a different linkage to that central metal. Uh, we call the atom with a lone pair the donor atom. When, with multiple donor atoms, that's when linkage isomers are possible. We can see the same thing is possible down here with the cyanoligand. And, uh, when it's bonded through the carbon, we call it cyano. When it's bonded through the nitrogen, we call it isocyano. Same thing down here. We can bond through the nitrogen or we can bond through either oxygen. So, And we get nitro versus nitrido in that case. And with SCN here, when it's bonded through the sulfur, so it's called thiocyanato, and when it's bonded through the nitrogen, we call it isothiocyanato. Uh, and that's reflected here in this example uh, above. When the sulfur is the first of the three atoms listed, that's the one that's actually directly bonded to the central metal ion. When the nitrogen, however, is the first one listed, then it's bonded through the nitrogen. That's kind of how they distinguish those. Uh, also take a look at coordination sphere isomers over here. And coordination sphere isomers, uh, basically just what's inside the coordination sphere and what's outside the coordination sphere is going to differ. So, and again, we show what's inside the coordination sphere with the lovely brackets here. And so, for one example here, we've got four water molecules, a chloride and a bromo ligand, all inside the coordination sphere, and then one chloride counter ion outside, where, as its corresponding coordination sphere isomer over here, we see his coordination sphere, He's got four water still, but two chloroligands and then a bromide counter ion. And so in this case, what's different is who the counter ion is, so, and therefore who's inside the coordination sphere. When you switch out ions in and out of the coordination sphere, we call these ionization isomers specifically. And that's not the most important name in the world, but it's one example of coordination sphere isomers. This next example is actually dealing with switching the waters in and out of the coordination sphere. So in this case, water. Um, can kind of be adsorbed into a compound. We call that a hydrate. So, and in this case, uh, when you have one water molecule adsorbed, we call it a monohydrate, and two, a dihydrate, so on and so forth. Uh, in this first example, we have four water molecules uh, bonding as ligands to chromium, and then one as a hydrate adsorbed to the, the structure. And then in the second example, all five water molecules are actually bonded as ligands with no water molecules as hydrates. So these specifically are called hydration isomers, but again, it's just another type of coordination sphere isomer here. All right, here we'll take a little closer look at our stereoisomers. And the first type, we'll take a lengthy look at the geometric isomers, the cis-trans isomers. Uh, and these can occur in three different places. So the first are in square planar complexes, and you gotta have exactly two of a monodentate ligand. So and I got a couple generic formulas here. So but we can see here, like in the examples I've given that are drawn out, these chlorines here have the opportunity of either being 90 degrees apart or, as in this example, 180 degrees apart. So and that's the big difference here, and that's cis versus trans. Now, you've got to be told that these are square planar because in a tetrahedral complex, 
again with a coordination of number of four, all the angles would be 109.5. There'd be no like 90 versus 180. So it's not just enough to see that you got a coordination number of four and you've got exactly two of them on a dentate ligand. You've got to be told that it's a square planar complex, not a tetrahedral complex. Now the second example is going to deal with octahedral complexes. So and if you look at an octahedral complex, all the bond angles are 90 degrees for any adjacent species. But if you look at two that are opposing each other, it'd be 180 degrees. So if we focus in on the two chlorines, it turns out it's an octahedral complex having exactly two of a monodentate ligand. So in this case, these two chlorines are 90 degrees apart. So, but in the other example here, these two chlorines are 180 degrees apart, and again, giving rise to cis and trans. Cis when they're 90 degrees apart, trans when they're 180 degrees apart. So finally, the last example here deals when you've got exactly two of a bidentate ligand like ethylene diamine here in this example. So what remains with two, exactly two of those bidentate ligands, in an octahedral complex, you've got two positions left for two monodentate ligands. And those two monodentate ligands, they can be identical, they can be two different ones as in this example. But the key is, again, the two remaining spots after the bidentate ligands bind, they're either 90 degrees apart or 180 degrees apart, which again leaves us with options of being either cis or trans. All right, the other type of stereoisomer that we gotta talk about are what are called optical isomers. We'll see why they're called optical isomers in a little bit. Uh, but these are going to be some of the, probably the most challenging ones to actually visualize in three dimensions. And so I'm going to try and show you an example here of one of these, but at the end of the day, you're probably uh, better off memorizing what three instances these are even possible in, because uh, they're a little difficult to see. Um, so stereoisomers, we got some vocabulary to talk about. Um, so basically, uh, we've got the word chiral here. So, and the word chiral refers to when two compounds have mirror images and those mirror images are not identical. So, and here's where things are gonna get a little bit challenging. So, but it turns out your hands are chiral. Your left hand and your right hand are mirror images of each other, but they're not identical. So, and it turns out your left hand would be the enantiomer, the next word of your right hand, those two different mirror image forms of chiral compounds are called enantiomers. Well, it turns out these chiral compounds they will rate, rotate plain polarized light, and that's what makes them optical isomers. So we call chiral compounds optically active as a result. It turns out though, if you have both the right-handed and left-handed form of that compound, if you will, the two different enantiomers, in a 50-50 mixture, uh, half the solution wants to rotate light one way, half the solution wants to rotate light the other way, overall light doesn't get rotated. And so racemic mixture, exact 50-50 mixture, is not optically active. So let's take a look at when compounds can be chiral. So the first example is dealing with a tetrahedral complex having four different ligands. Turns out when you get to organic chemistry, you're gonna deal with this one a lot. All right, here I'm gonna provide you with a couple of examples. Uh, here we've got two tetrahedral molecules. All the bond angles are 109.5 degrees apart. They've both got four different things. I can see that right down the middle, they're perfect mirror images of each other. So, but even though they're perfect mirror images of each other, if you try to superimpose them here, it is not going to work. So I can line up two out of the four groups, but the other two, in this case, the red and the green, are not gonna match up. So these are mirror images, but they are non-superimposable, I like to say non-identical, mirror images. These would be enantiomers of each other. This is that first example, so tetrahedral compound with four different groups. So most compounds and their mirror images are identical, but chiral compounds and their mirror images are indeed different. And these two different forms are called enantiomers. It turns out stereoisomers can also show up in octahedral complexes having three bidentate ligands. We saw an example of one of those at the beginning of this chapter. So like in this case, if I've got three ethylene diamines, it turns out there's a right-handed and a left-handed version of this. They're mirror images, but they are not identical. So it's a little difficult to see unless you actually build a three-dimensional model, and I would recommend just memorizing this. Three bidentate ligands in an octahedral complex? Yep. It'll have two different enantiomers. It is a chiral compound. So the last one here is octahedral complex having two bidentate ligands and two monodentate ligands that are cis to each other. So in this case, we've got two bidentate ethylene diamine ligands and then two monodentate chlorines. And provided those chlorines are only 90 degrees apart, in the cis version, not 180 degrees apart in trans, gotta be cis, turns out there will also be a right-handed and left-handed version of this as well. Cool, and again, you can build the model and see it, 
Otherwise, these are things that are tough to view, and it's it's just simply easier to memorize the, the case here. Octahedral, two bidentates, two monodentates in the cis conformation. That's capable of optical isomers. So these are the three situations when optical isomers are possible, and I highly recommend you memorize them. I try to make you see it once, but at the end of the day, um, if you can see it, you're probably a very artsy person, and good for you. <laughs> but the vast majority of students are really going to struggle with this one, and I highly just recommend you memorize these three instances.